Before the age of pressure transducers and vacuum sensors, we used to rely on the secondary ignition pattern as our window into the engine. It helped us solve a lot of drivability complaints and it still can. In fact, this technique may be the only way that you'll find your customer's problem. Learn more in today's edition of The Trainer. I'm sure you've seen or heard quite a bit about in-cylinder pressure testing and the use of pressure transducers and pressure sensors to very quickly and accurately diagnose the condition or the mechanical condition of an automotive engine. But before those days, we had to rely on this, getting data from the ignition pattern. Now we're going to start talking about a primary ignition pattern. And I'm going to tell you why. Because today, so many systems use a coil-on-plug ignition system, and obtaining a secondary pattern can be almost impossible. Getting to the primary, though, is usually pretty easy, especially if you can access it directly at the ECM. Now, this particular pattern is taken from an old Ford Focus that used Ford's multi-strike distributorless ignition system. You're still seeing these systems in your shop, and the things that we're going to learn from this pattern apply equally to any ignition pattern that you want to get a capture of. So let's say we go ahead and get started and take a look at our primary ignition coil pattern. Now this pattern was captured using a single channel of the lab scope. The negative lead for my scope is attached to battery ground and the positive side of my meter lead is attached to the control side or the ground side of the ignition coil primary. Now think a minute about how we have our meter leads placed in the circuit. Isn't that the same way you would set up a ground side voltage drop test? Well, let's take a look at the pattern with that concept in the back of our minds. Here you can see where the coil has been turned on and the coil has been pulled to ground. In other words, the driver has completed the circuit. And if we were performing a voltage drop test, we would know that before that circuit was closed, no current would be flowing, and we should measure what? On the other side of the coil, the ground side of the coil. Well, we should see source voltage, shouldn't we? And that's exactly what we see prior to the turn on. Now, once we've completed the circuit, current starts to flow, and the primary, being the load in the circuit, should pull that voltage all the way to ground. And on the other side of the coil, we should read very little, if any, voltage remaining. That's the whole concept behind voltage drop testing, isn't it? Let's zoom in and take a look. You can see that we have almost one volt left over. Admittedly, the reading isn't 100% accurate, but does it point to a possible problem? It depends on the type of driver used in the ECM. Some offset from ground is perfectly normal. On transistor drivers, 0.7 volts is about right, while MOSFET drivers are a little less, around 0.3 volts. But if you see more than that, it could indicate a bad driver in the ECM. The next thing I want you to take a look at on the pattern is just how long the current is left on, or the circuit is being turned on by the ECM. This is referred to also as the dwell time. Now, just a side note, we're looking at static patterns, but when you're using this as an aid for diagnostics, you can't go by one or two screen captures. You want to watch this as it's in operation on the vehicle, and better yet, you want to even bring down a second channel, hook up another uh, coil to it, and use that as a comparison, a known good versus a suspect, if you will. If you see the on time varying or significantly shorter than the other coils on the vehicle, it could indicate a problem either in the coil or in the ECM itself. Now notice what happens when we turn the power off. We get this huge upward skyrocketing kick. And it's not to be confused with what you would see on the secondary pattern. This is not firing voltage, and it does not have the same diagnostic usefulness 
that it would if it were on the secondary side of the pattern. What this is, is the effect on the primary windings when that magnetic field collapses. It induces voltage, hence the name inductive kick. And you'll see this on any electrical component that uses a coil to operate. That's an injector, uh, EVAP solenoid, transmission solenoid, anything like that will have some type of inductive kick when you turn the current flow off through that coil. What I wanted to point out here is that this is at about 220 volts in this particular case. When you're doing this test and you're connecting this to your scope, make sure that you know what the maximum input voltage that your scope can handle is. If it's less than 220 volts, then you'll need a device called an attenuator. This is a device that just goes in line with your scope leads and reduces the amount of incoming voltage to a level that's safe for your tool. Now, I've seen some of these go as high as 400, so make sure you check that out. And you don't let any smoke out of that valuable piece of equipment. Now, as I mentioned, the inductive kick has limited diagnostic use. It does provide an indication of the health of the primary windings, and you can compare them to each other if you suspect a weak or shorted coil. It does not provide the same information as the secondary firing line does, and I'll clarify that when we get to the secondary pattern and compare the two. Now, in this particular example, also note that we have in two inductive kicks. This is unique to the Ford multi-strike ignition system that actually fires the plug two, even three times in quick succession at idle. And this is also why we have two spark or burn lines, as you can see here. This area of the pattern has real diagnostic value. The primary ignition pattern mirrors the secondary here, so all the same info and impacts you'd see in the secondary, you'll also find here. Now let's focus on a few. The point where the voltage trace goes from vertical to horizontal is the amount of voltage required to initiate the spark across the plug. It's called spark KV, and we can't accurately measure it on the primary pattern, but it is valid for comparison to known good cylinders. It's also valuable in diagnostics because it's affected by any change in resistance in the secondary side of the ignition system. But remember that resistance can be more than electrical resistance, like open wires or corroded cables. It can also be affected by the amount of pressure in the combustion chamber and the fuel mixture in the spark plug gap. The time the voltage remains horizontal is the time the spark is actually traveling across the gap, and it's referred to as the burn time. Ideally, the spark will continue until all the fuel in the gap is combusted with a little left over. And that's what you see here. The air fuel mix is probably pretty close to ideal since the burn line is relatively flat before ending in that sharp upward oscillation. That last little rise is called the nose, by the way, and it indicates that all the air fuel mix has been burned. Another telltale is the series of oscillations immediately following the nose. And these are caused by the dissipation of the coil's remaining energy. The little left in the secondary creates another magnetic field in the primary that then creates another in the secondary and so on. Think of it as a swing set, swinging back and forth less and less each time until it finally comes to a stop. Now in addition to looking at the primary voltage pattern, it's a really good idea to look at that coil's current ramp at the same time. It really add some diagnostic muscle to your capture. Let's home in on just the current. When the ECM driver closes the circuit, current starts to flow into the primary windings. Notice the oscillations at the start of this pattern. This is normal and expected. If it isn't there, it could indicate a weak or shorted secondary coil. Notice how the current climbs smoothly to a peak. That's not always the case. It's dependent on how the current in the coil is controlled. In some systems, there is a current limit on the coil, and you'll see the top chopped off, something like this. It's also important that the current be turned off cleanly and quickly, or the magnetic field collapse will be weak, or the weak spark as a result. Rule of thumb, less than 100 microseconds. That's right microseconds. So use your cursors to measure the turnoff time and to look like something like this.
Now this clean turnoff applies to any electrical component that uses a coil of wire and magnetic field to operate. So again, that's the fuel injectors, the EVAP solenoids, even the transmission shift solenoids. Now let's take a look at the same pattern taken directly on the secondary side. Okay, there are a few things that are unique to the secondary pattern that I think we need to make sure that we talk about. And let's start off by that point here, that rapid rise that we remember seeing in the primary side. Now, if you recall, I explained to you that on the primary side, it's called an inductive kick. And it was based on the fact of that coil's energy collapsing around the windings in the primary and inducing voltage in those windings. That's what we saw there. This is not quite the same. This is actually the, the voltage that's now being uh, induced in the secondary windings but that level is never going to remain that constant. In fact, if you watch this running on the engine, you're going to see it bounce all over the place. That's because this is actually a diagnostic aid. This is how much voltage required in that particular moment to get the gap ready for the spark to go across. That's to get everything lined up and ionized. And it's affected by what's called the greatest gap. Most cases today, well, we don't have too many distributor systems anymore, so there's no rotor to cap gap it should be this in the spark plug gap. That's where the greatest gap should be. And if that's the case, it's not just the size of the gap, it's also the conditions that gap is working under. Compression pressure, for example. It takes a lot less energy to jump a gap outside the engine as it does inside. Another factor is the air-fuel mixture inside the gap. Is it conductive or is it too lean to, uh, uh, to not provide a conductive path for electrons to follow? So there's other factors that are involved. Another thing I want to point out to you here is you'll notice here there are more oscillations at the end of that first burst on the multi-strike. Well, again, that's what you see. That's energy that's remaining in the coil that we haven't used yet. It's, it's ringing back and forth, but we very quickly energize it again and use up the rest in that second strike. So that's what you, why you see what you see here. But the biggest thing that I want you to take away when you're looking at the secondary side, other than the fact that you need to make sure you watch it live, and then look at the comparison, is that there's a, a maximum amount of energy available coming out of that coil. And the best way I can describe it is to use a technique that was taught to me. Uh, it's not a piece of rope, but it'll do. If you imagine this length of wire is all the energy that coil has to provide. And I'm gonna use some to prepare the, the way, and then I'm going to use the rest to start and maintain that, um, that burn across the plug gap. So if I do anything that's going to increase or make it harder to prepare the way, it's going to increase my firing demand, but it's also going to reduce what I have left over, maintaining the, the uh, spark across the gap. And when you're diagnosing drivability concerns using either the primary or the secondary pattern, you must take all the elements into account, and as I said, view the pattern live while comparing them to each other. For example, if you're looking for the cause of a cylinder misfire in number one, it would be helpful to look at the pattern for an adjacent cylinder as well. Now typically, any abnormalities that occur to the left of an imaginary center line drawn through the burn line indicates a change in resistance outside of the combustion chamber, while any abnormalities to the right would indicate problems in the combustion chamber. Well, I hope I've given you enough information to make you curious and maybe a little dangerous. Take some time now to take this technique back into the shop, create some situations of your own, and then look at what happens to the pattern. This is how you'll learn and eventually master this valuable diagnostic technique. Mm -hmm.